Hi, I'm Wayne Tuttle and welcome to Chasing Legends. Welcome back to Chasing Legends. I'm Wayne Tuttle, your host once again. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, to get up all our updates on our videos and upcoming stuff on Mondays and Fridays. And additionally, go to our website at www.legendofsuperstitionmountains.com. You can follow it through the About section, pick up shirts, hats, coffee cups, check out the archives, the bark mills, and all that fun stuff. Got that stuff out of the way. It's much my nicer than having some pop-up, right? Just sort of blah and show up here. So this week we're going to go into, delve into the stories of people have said they found lost gold bars. And it's one particular story, but we'll kind of give a little overview built into it. Um, the first person back probably in the 1930s that started coming up with the whole, I found gold bars in the superstition is a man named John Hallenbach. And there's not a lot written about him or anything, but he made a claim that he found some gold bars in the superstitions in a cave and all this. Could never relocate the cave. Happens. And then sometime later is a man named Bob Baxter. And I believe Bob Baxter is maybe in the late 40s, early 50s, somewhere around there. Bob Baxter had his story and a similar thing happened. He found these gold bars in this cave and stuff and he couldn't find it. Crazy Jake had his version of a story, but he kind of was clever. He found a cave, it's up in the Squaw, and what he did was he made it in such an inaccessible place that he would show everybody where it was and say, I need to raise the funds to find a way to get all these gold bars out of there. So he'd raise the money because nobody could get to it because people would literally give up rather than go up there and make the effort. So it was kind of clever on his part to raise the money for people to get to a cave and physically they just realized, you know what, I'll give you the money you can, and when you get the gold bars, we'll split it. I, I don't... I'm not going up there. Um, in addition to him, there were several other stories that um, in the 60s and 70s that kind of became quite popular. There was the Harry France or Harry LaFrance story. There was the Bob Brady story and the Ray Diamond story. Now, Ray Diamonds you'll find in Ripples of Lost Echoes, Bob Ward. Uh, more to test to that, said Ray Diamond told him the story. Um, the Harry France, LaFrance, and the Bob Brady stories, the particulars usually in that um are ernie province dale howard and um tracy hawkins and most of these gentlemen were around for a long time to tell people those the stories i got to hear a lot of the stories about this the harry france and the bob brady stories directly from ernie and tracy very nice gentlemen um long time dutch hunters guys are back in the mountains um additionally joe Roboto. His uncle Chuck was involved with them when they were searching for these in Old West Boulder and into Needle Canyon and stuff and around Blacktop Bluff Springs. So you have those variations of those stories, each one they had. We don't want to really go into those, but and maybe someday we will go to those specific stories of Harry France um, and uh, Bob Brady. But additionally, um, Dan Hopper told one um, out going into first, first Water, there was a there's a little hill there they dug out and they found sometimes i think the story was one gold bar other times it was three but there was just a very small amount found and they dug up the whole hillside randy wright and i went out there and checked it all out they extensively just went at it but they never found anything else so you have those different stories but to me always the granddaddy that came along got documented and was probably the best story. And remember, we're talking story is the Walter Perrine story. Now, Walter Perrine's story goes back. He's born in New Jersey. His name is Walter Perrine Jr. His father's name is Walter Perrine Sr. And he grows up there. And his claim is that he had a grandmother, Lydia or Lydian Perrine. And he says his mother was unable to care for him and his grandmother raised him. She raises him, and before her death, she tells him this story that as a young girl, she was born just somewhere between Weaver's Needle and Blacktop Mesa, and she grew up as an Apache. She was an Apache, and there's a photograph of her. Could be, according to the photograph, if that's Lydian Prine. And then he says there was this place on Blacktop 
There was an open hole that led into a cave system. And she has a 10, 10, 12 year old girl. The Apaches take her up there and she wants to see what's in there. And they were getting ready to seal it up. They lower into it. She said there were these gold bars about three foot high stacked along in there. There's also an underground spring. And if you follow one of the cave's channels, um, the, the water's shallow there, only about a foot deep because it's got an underground stream from the spring. And you go back and there's this geode, quite a large geode, split in two halves. Some, sometimes it's said it's purple, sometimes it's blue. And one half is still there, but she was allowed, for some reason, we don't know why, to take half. And she had half and she supposedly gave it to Walter were thinking because that was kind of the gist of the story but if he ever went and found this place and put the two halves of the geodes together the gold would not really matter because then he would become the leader of the apaches also part of the sub story is there'd be world peace no more war and all this stuff for putting the two geodes together i know you're thinking why didn't they just put them together in the first place i don't know so that's the story of course he hears this from his grandmother and then after that, he's getting older. He goes down, travels into Georgia. He runs moonshine and liquor. Then he moves to Florida. He opens a bodybuilding and martial arts shop with an investor. It doesn't really do well. And then he needs realizes suddenly he needs to get out of Dodge fast. He writes a bad check and heads for Arizona because he realizes, my grandmother told me this story. I might as well go to Arizona and check it out. So he flees, basically, or runs from Florida, goes to Arizona, and that's where he shows up at. Um, shortly after landing in Arizona, he hooks up with two individuals, were kind of known, um, Carl Broderick, and um, the other gentleman's name was, um, I'm trying to remember offhand, um, John Combs. And they go up initially, and, they, and there's maps and some things showing the site. Um, and he starts digging and they start going off this hole. Now, one of the things is early on is they get an old V6 Ford engine. They haul it up there, get a compressor, and they're jackhammering and doing all kinds of stuff. Now, what people got to understand is that trail coming out of First Water at one time, that was a road that went all the way down into Barkley Basin. When I was a kid, you could still see that it was a pretty, pretty well-defined road from the ranchers and a lot of stuff from back in the era. John Pierce, who had a mine back in there at one point, wanted to run the road all the way to the Pierce Mine, which would be what I always refer to as almost the southeast end of Blacktop. And he wasn't able to, but that was the consideration. So they were able to get that engine pretty close, but they still hauled it up by parts up on the Blacktop and ran it up there. Um, nothing came to it. Walter Prime would say much, much later he had been digging in the wrong spot. Now, the story gets a little twisted and turned because after them, he was up in the mountains. And I got to have notes because there's so many people. There's the McNeilan brothers, a guy named Tony, a half-breed named Geronimo, a guy named John, and another guy named Davey. And they hook up with him, and this is during the Bob Ward era. And at this point, they found a cave and they're digging dirt out. Now, what they're doing is they found loose fill all through this place. And they're digging the dirt out and they're finding the dirt and what they're digging out of this cave seemed to have been packed in there and it came down from a lower area. So it had been brought up the mountain and then packed in there. It was midway down Blacktop is what he claimed. Bob Ward talks about it as Val Paris. He did an article in a newspaper concerning the site. I don't think he uses Walter's name or anybody's name directly, but he talks about the site. And one of the things that has become legendary about this story is they had a crack and if they threw things into this crack they couldn't really see in they could see it was pitch black as far as they could see they would hear stuff drop and hit water so they knew there was an opening a cavern something in there um, some open area and it possibly could be this underground spring and stuff so what they did was they decided to try to put dynamite sticks in there and then try to light them to blow this crack open kind of open it up more um, I guess, unfortunately, what happened is the light dynamite kept slipping through and going through and then landing in the water. So they weren't successful. They finally found or drilled a hole or something and put the dynamite in and blasted. And they said after they set a large charge, they came back in and the wall was exactly the same as it was before. Now, it could be they didn't have much blasting experience or whatnot. And, that, and that's pretty much likely. Um, Ray Schnell, another Schnell 
uh, another Dutch hunter who had been out in the mountains for quite a while was another person who participated in all this and different things. So um, it was quite an ongoing thing for quite a few years. Um, I know Jim Hat hooked up and became involved and met with Walter and sat down and did some video interviews. Um, I don't know what happened to those original tapes. It would be nice to preserve them because they are on tape and um, preserve the entirety of it. Walter had, did several patents for guns and several other things. So Jim had a lot of interest in him, met with him. Um, Walter felt he'd been digging in the wrong spot and was trying to give up information. I don't know how specific it was, but he, he told his story and what happened with a number of people, this cave system um, that they were digging out. Um, and then these other places that they dug up on blacktop. And that kind of like was most of that story for the time. Now we have Combs and Carl Broderick. Broderick, um, most people would remember, he, he spent a lot of time with um, Andy Sinbad and then became friends with Her Herman Petrash. And there is an inner circle of guys that always seem to hang together. You find there's one or two names and they all, and, and Carl Broderick was with quite a few people. So he seemed to move from story to story with a lot of these people. And Carl Broderick also told this story. So. You have Walter's version of the story, and you have Carl talking about the time they were there. John Combs talked about it. I believe he talked to Jim Hat too. And there was a number of people that visited up there, um, all Jim, Bob Ward, and all his people. So that kind of is the gist of it. And you go, well, God, Blacktop, it, it, it's a large area, but there's so much to do up there. I, I, I wonder why nobody's been able to find it or any evidence. Well, what happens as time goes by, and, and definitely things were opening up during that time period, was everybody wanted to find out, Walter Perrine, okay, how, who is his grandmother, when she, was she here, is there any records, which it possibly might not be. And they looked and found a Lydia, a Lydian, or Lydia Perrine in New Jersey. The problem is every Lydia Perrine that they could find in New Jersey lived and died there. So they couldn't really tie anything in. And then the other problem that seemed to have happened is Walter's mother passed away and, and it did help the story. She passed away when he was very young. She's not listed in census records. His father's listed as a widower. So you could think, okay, maybe his mother passed away and his grandmother helped, but his grandmother's name was Blanche. His mother's name was Virginia and he had a stepmom named Virginia. So then we're wondering, is it something wrong with this? Is there anything basis? Um, his daughter even came up, Walter's daughter came out and publicly said that it was all bull. Um, it was all made up stuff and all. And that seems unusual as much time and effort and everything they put into it. Because he didn't really seem to be profiting from all this. He just seemed to be spending a lot of time in the mountains digging. There is a Lydia Prine that is attached to his family directly. Now, if you look in the census records, no Lydia Prine shows up. So it makes you curious. Um, his father was born in 1903, so she would have been 43 when, you know, and it, maybe it's a stepmother, but Lydia Prine shows up one time connected to Walter Prine and Walter Prine Sr. That is in Walter Prine Sr.'s draft information for um, selective service at the time for World War II. 1942, she shows up and he says the person, the contact, his contact person is Lydia Prine. That's it. Doesn't say it's his mother, his grandmother, the relationship, anything like that. That's the only time, and it's not Lydian like it's been touted to be. It's Lydia Perrine. So we kind of have that. It, it, it's hard to say exactly if there's something there or even something to hang on. His own daughter kind of claims all oh, this is. Now we have audio interviews, and eventually in the archives, we're going to try to get the audio interviews of a lot of these people I mentioned. There's tons of them for all of them Tracy Hawkins and Walter Perrine, and um, I'm trying to think, Carl Broderick. And we'll try to get those up in an audio section and, and make sure they're available on YouTube with some sort of like slideshow as you watch them. But the problem is we're left with Walter Perrine, like almost all the gold stories. Walters, they never found anything. At least some of the others, they pretended or at least said they found a gold bar and then lost it. We have a photograph of one and the drawings of a couple others, but... There's nothing really tangible to it. Um, the Apache 
did occasionally spend time in the superstitions, but they're very nomadic. They wouldn't have been long-term camps in there. Maybe during the winter, they would have settled down for a while. Um, Garden Valley had one group that spent time in it. But the, the superstitions were not like the Apache stronghold or a place that they had permanent spaces. In, in fact, most in, the indigenous people in the area, just, they kind of like they might have traveled through, spent some time, had some camps there briefly. But mostly after the, you know, the Hohokam and those type of groups, everything was gone. In fact, the Apache Trail, one of those little misnomers that we get is the Apache Trail was known as um, it was a wagon trail, like a Salt River wagon trail. But it was the Anasazi route, trade route between them and the Hohokam. And anyone that ever studies us, a lot of people were very superstitious. So most of the indigenous groups tribes, clans, and whatnot would be very superstitious about being around those, and they, and they avoided the Anasazi and the Hohokam and the Salado areas quite a bit. So it, it, it's kind of an oddball story without anything figuratively, factually, um, but it's always worth the trip. Um, I've spent a lot of time up on Blacktop Mesa. It's a very interesting place. It, it was a very much a hotbed for so many Dutch hunters, and I've always thought the story's interesting. The background's interesting that these guys spent so much time, but there is one interesting little anecdote I'll put at the end of this. So Randy Wright and I are up there, and we're crawling around and boulder hopping up around Blacktop. And we're about probably about a third midway up. And there's these big boulders, and there's this log holding this boulder up, and it's a hole. And Randy and I look at each other and look at the hole. And it's not a very big hole. It's a small hole. If you're a small child, you would have to be lowered down into the hole. If you're in a grown adult, you can kind of get down. There's some boulders, and you can kind of get on these boulders and find some a way to get down. And it's a very large cave opening. And you work your way back through it, and it, it's open. It's got a high ceiling. It fits that story like a team. Now, there's no spring, no running water. In fact, someone broke in and at it to enter it from the other side. So once you're in, once you travel down the length of it, there is an adit that opens up and, and takes you into it. So someone else had found it. Very odd. It fits the story. And you always wonder if the actual physical topography that someone else discovered somehow leads to a story or how they always interconnect. <coughs> and I would tell you, if I took you there, we went in, you would say, this is the spot. Um, but it's not. And whoever was in there dug some stuff, and there's some drops in it, and there's some tunneling, but it's just basically a natural cave, and but that's been turned into something of a prospect along the way, which a lot of them did. A lot of them would find a, a natural cave or alcove, and then they would start digging in the back of it, thinking, I guess I got an extra so many feet. So we found that. Someday I'll talk about that whole entirety of that story and maybe we'll put up a little bit of slideshow of pictures with it as I walk through it because it was an interesting trip. It was a little scary when we dropped down into that thing because it was big wide open. But it reminded us at the time, we thought, wow, this is the Walter Perrine type thing. And of course, there's no gold bars, but we were thinking, man, this would be pretty cool if we could actually put something to this. And then, of course, there was a light at the end of the tunnel, which kind of screwed the whole story up. So there's that, the Walter Perrine story. Um, if we ever get a hold of the Jim Hat original tapes and the family or someone has those, I don't know what happened to a lot of Jim's stuff. I think he, towards the end, started giving a lot of stuff away to people that don't share. Our idea is if you don't share it, it doesn't really matter because you haven't found it. Jim's passed away quite some time now. And if you haven't enacted on it or done anything with it, you're doing just what everybody else has done. It's just abject to failure because... You're not putting it out there for public. You're, you're never going to find anything by just keeping it secretive and not finding anything. Share it with the public. Let people hear what people have to say. Maybe someone comes up with a solution. And the person, right person with a kind heart, yeah, what are they going to do? They'll share. They'll give you peace maybe, right? But otherwise, nobody gets anything. So we're going to continue to share what we get and everything on these tapes. I hope you enjoyed the story and a little bit of the history through this as we kind of went down a little different rabbit hole. And we got a few more stories that kind of twist and turn and all. But we're going to kind of stick to the superstitions a little bit here for a while. So I hope everybody enjoyed that. I hope everybody's well. Remember again, 
hit subscribe, go over, hit www.legendsuperstitionmountains.com. I'm going to get a bunch more stuff loaded into it in the next few weeks, documents and photographs, old photographs and stuff like that. And we continue to kind of like amass the video and the film collections that we can. We'll continue to do archive stuff and occasionally put out live stuff. And look forward here soon because we're probably about seven, eight, nine episodes in of where we're almost ready to release that 12 episodes from the COVID era. And we'll get that out. And I think everybody's going to really enjoy that stuff. So there you go. Always remember, I'm Wayne Tuttle. You're not. This was Chasing Legends.